touch on us tonight. Uh, you know, we're talking about faith. And uh, let, me, let me tell you something. I, I want to challenge you because I've been thinking about this. I've been thinking about it a lot. You know, we're so blessed here at Brownsville. Oh, I want to tell you, I think, I think uh, uh, I'm not just saying this, but we're so blessed. I think John Kilpatrick, I believe, personally, I've, I've met a lot of men, I believe is the finest example of a pastor that I've ever seen anywhere. I mean, his heart, the way he handles himself, and the way he handles the word, and, and just everything about it. And then, and, and Richard, and I'm not saying it's because Richard is here, but the fire that he has, and, and um, has to be uh, one of the top, uh, top, very top and best youth leaders in the country. And I, he didn't pay me anything to say that. But I, but I, but I thank God, and, and, and he, doesn't, he doesn't know this, but um, the other day someone was visiting and Richard had gotten up and he was making a statement about, he says, my, my young people, my young people. You know, it's easy to be critical if you want to be critical. And so this person came up, this visitor came up to me, Richard, and said, you know, uh, I just want to tell you something. I, I have a problem with something. He said, everything belongs to God. And that's what he said. And I thought, well, what's the problem with that? I mean, I, can I agree with that? And he said, well, he said, just like, for example, he said, uh, that Crisco fellow, you see. He said, uh, you know, he refers to the young people as, as my group, my kids, my young people. You know, he said, he said, I, I, I'm, I'm offended by that. And uh, so I said, well, you know, interesting thing is I have two kids, and they both are under him. And I said, I love it when he says, my young people, because I know that it means that he's taking a responsibility, complete responsibility over their lives. And when he says, my young people, he's saying, these are the ones that I care for. And that's just wonderful. And I know my wife and we both talked about that, to be able to release them to go to that kind of leadership and know what they're going to receive. Now, we're responsible for teaching our kids too, but, but I'm, I'm thankful for that. And I can go on down the line. I know whether it's uh, Steve. I believe Steve is one of the top evangelists. I mean, I, I don't know but any evangelist that I respect more than, than Steve Hill and the fire that, that is in him, not just because of revival, but the integrity and everything that's there. Now, what am I doing? Just kind of giving a pat on the back to everybody. And I could go on down the line. You know, Kerry Robertson and Lyndall Cooley, and you know, Lyndall's a trip, you know. This guy, I, I, you know, I, I get upset with him because, he, he, you know, I tell him this from time to time. I said, you know, Lyndall, um, I'm really upset because, you know, whenever God's starting to hand out all these blessings, you got in both lines, you know. <laughs> and he can communicate, and, and, he can, and he can worship. And, but let me tell you something. One of the things that I would say that would be a concern is how easy it would be to settle into Brownsville with all the blessings that are there and say, let these guys do it. And I believe God wants to challenge you, and not just you here, but the church at Brownsville, that God has got some things. I believe some difficult days are in front of us. I believe very difficult days. Now, I'm not a prophet. I'm just a teacher. And, I, and I'm certainly uh, not prophesying right now. But, I mean, you don't have to be a brain surgeon, you know, to be able to understand that there are some difficult days. You just got to read the Bible. It says in the last days, difficult times will come. And, and he, hound, he, he pounds that home and reminds us that, that we're going to be facing difficult days. Now, my message tonight is faith for difficult times. And what kind of person does he want out of us? So as we go before the Lord, one of the things that I would like to have, I'd like to have us do is ask God that he would expand, enlarge our borders, expand our tent, begin to, begin to cause us to realize that God did not place you in this church to have you enjoy the leadership that he's given only but to be moved by it to the point where there will be something in your life that God will give you the faith to challenge and that you'll stand up and rise up and say, that's my mission. That's what God's called me to be a part of. And that's what he's called me to do. How many of you understand what I'm saying? It's so easy just to rest in the blessings of God. So I want us to pray right now because I believe that God has a purpose other than just spreading revival. I, I believe he wants a people that know how to stand in difficult times and stand so strong as to be able to help somebody else by the hand because of the faith that you have and the faith that God's put within you to be able to reach out and touch somebody else. 
Let me tell you something. You need, to, you need to understand that there's somebody that's looking at you. You have an arm of trust. If you're walking with God, you have an arm of trust. You know what I mean by that? That means that there's an arm that somebody else can grab hold of because they've seen your life and they trust you. Somebody. It could be on the job. It could be your neighbor. It could be a relative. I don't know who it is, but you have that. You have a shadow of influence. And God wants to create a faith in us that will challenge things and believe God for things that are beyond what we're presently believing Him for. And so I want to pray right now that God will speak to all of our hearts and He'll begin to, to challenge us and push us on, that we'll begin to say, God, what do you want to use me for? Thank you for the blessings you've given here. What do you want to use me for? What do you want to do in my heart? What do you want to do in my life, in my family? What do you want to do around the block? What do you want to do? Let's pray. Jesus, pray this with me. Jesus, I want to glorify you. I want my life to exalt you. I want to become what you desire me to be. Lord Jesus, this thing of faith, I want you to show me what it is. I want you to expand my faith. Enlarge it and increase it. Not to get what I want, but to bless you, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Now speak to my heart, Lord. Make the Word come alive. And speak to me individually. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You know, I, sometimes uh, uh, I, there's some things that have happened in my life that there's some stories that I tell from time to time. And my wife thinks I tell them too much. But, but uh, you know, God's, there's one I'm going to tell and, and, uh, that happened in New York City. And uh, I'm telling it for a reason, not just to tell a story, but uh, to use it as a bit of an illustration of how uh, God, uh, God spoke to me about two weeks ago with this statement. And I want you to hear me because it may apply to some of you here. It just shocked me because I wasn't really asking the Lord to speak anything. I'm not a, but he said to me, my church is filled with people who have a controversy with me. My church is filled with people who have a controversy with me because they don't understand me or my ways. And it, and it shocked me, and I, as I began to just kind of seek the Lord and pray about it, I, one of the things that God made very, very clear to me is that here's where the controversy is. That the church is filled with people that have tried to grasp this thing called faith. They, they prayed for somebody that was close to them, that they loved very dearly to be healed, maybe of cancer or some disease, and it didn't happen. Or they, they prayed for something to take place in their own lives, and it hasn't happened yet. It doesn't mean it's not going to, but it hasn't happened yet. That they faced things that were difficult for them, and as they stepped out, believing God as strongly as they could, it didn't come to pass. And, and they won't say it. Because they know, they, they know. See, what happens is you turn that in on yourself because you begin to say, well, I'm not going to blame God. But down secretly inside, there's a questioning of God. Why didn't you do it, God? Why didn't it come to pass? It's a controversy with God. And, and if you have a controversy with God, He wants to heal that tonight. He wants to take it out because it'll block you from going forward. And so I've entitled this uh, Faith for Difficult Times. And, and I want you to just maybe see some things. And I want us to look at the possibilities of faith. But what I was going to share the story is that I, I was in New York City and my wife and I were. In New York, they closed down a lot of the buildings in the daytime or on Saturdays and Sundays because there's not traffic in those buildings. They're not being used. And so they'll turn the air conditioning down very, very low and... And, uh, and they all, uh, <clears throat> it gets hot in there. And so I was in the office and I was studying for my Sunday message and, and I was getting hot and I was frustrated because things weren't ever coming together. I don't know, Richard, if you ever have times like that, but you know, it's, uh, it's almost two minutes to too late. You gotta get a sermon real quick. And you've been busy and you, you haven't purposely put it off, but it just seems like things are dragging and you just, you just are trying your best to hear God's voice and it's just like, there's nothing. And uh, so that's what was happening. And so 
we were going to go on vacation. So I had gone to the bank earlier and I had gotten, uh, you know, cash uh, instead of traveler's checks. I don't know why, but we got in cash uh, for the vacation. And I was carrying more money on me than I, than I, uh, than I thought. I mean, that I, that I would normally would have. And so, and I had these white pants on and a polo shirt. And so I went out for a walk on a place called Riverside Drive. And as you go up Riverside, it's a long sidewalk. And then there's a park over there and where kids play. And I'm just walking along and I'm just trying to clear my mind. And, and somebody comes up and, and they, they just bump me just with their shoulder like that. Now that can happen in New York City. And I didn't think anything about it. And so, you know, just kind of looked like this and then bumped me again like this. And then, then they grabbed my arm and kind of held me like that and had one of these pouches on, you know, joggers and people have these, you know, little pouches and with a belt and so on. And, and so, but he's, what he has done is he's got a gun and he's pulled the gun out and he's holding it. He's right up against me and he's holding this gun right here to my ribs. And, uh, and he says, he says, give me your money. And I think, oh, why? Why not yesterday? <laughs> what, I mean, I'm carrying more money. This is unusual. It's a, I mean, it's, it's the worst time in the world to be robbed, you know when you're carrying more money than you've ever carried, you know. It wasn't, I mean, it's not going to make me rich, but it's still, I don't want to part with it. And, uh, and so, you know, I start stalling a bit, and I say, you don't want to do this. It was a, you say the stupidest things in trials. You don't want to rob me. Well, of course he did. That's why he's got the gun. You, know. <laughs> you don't want to do this. And he said, give me your money. Well, I did something, and this is not bravery. I don't even know the mental process that happened, but... But there was, a, there was a, a, some loud laughter and, and a kid crying. I don't know if he fell or what, but he cried. And, and just all of a sudden it happened over in that playground and it startled him. And so he turned, he turned his head like this to look at it. And when he did, I took my hand because he had a hammer back on the gun. And I took my hand and I jammed it down like this so it, could, you know, it couldn't fire because it, it's, it's caught right there. And so I turned it away from me. And uh, I'm not a brave person, but I know this was an angel because suddenly he shot backwards. I mean, literally, and he landed on his rump. I mean, it's like he just shot backwards, okay, and just landed flat on his bottom and jumped up and took off running. And it was almost like he was taking a leap backwards on purpose. I really believe. I mean, I do. I believe there was an angelic aid and help at that moment. I believe an angel threw him back like that, you know. <clears throat> but what happened was when he started flying backwards, he let go of the gun. And so I'm standing here on the streets of New York City holding a pistol. And I don't know what to do with it. And so I, I, you know, I unloaded it first. And I, and, I, and I told you I had white pants on. Now, I don't know if you know what with white pants, but I put the gun in my pocket. White pants don't hide pistols in your pocket. I mean, it's just shining out like this. I mean, it's just right there. And, uh, and so now I, think, I can't do this because, you know, somebody's going to see that, some policeman, and I'm probably going to get shot. So it's a long block, and I'm going to walk up to this phone booth. I know there's a phone booth up there. And uh, so New Yorkers are so funny. So I decided I'd unload the pistol, which I'd already done, and I held it by the barrel. So, and I, you know, the cock, I cocked, the, un, cocked the hammer. I'm holding it by the barrel, and I'm carrying it up the sidewalk. I feel it might as well be obvious. But, you know, I'm not threatening in any way. I'm holding it by the barrel up toward me. New Yorkers are so funny because that New Yorkers think if they can just not look at it, it does not exist. And so they're walking like this, and they look down at the gun, and then they go. And they're just walking away like, he, he's not there. <laughs> and I, and uh, so, so anyway... I, I got up to the phone booth, and how many, you've seen those phone booths that are, there's a pole, you know, here, and, there, and, the, and the booth kind of comes up like that. It's kind of a half little shell that you stand in. And so I walked up, and I got as close, my chest as close to that shell as I could, and I put the gun right there, and, uh, and so I called 911 and, and told the police exactly what happened, and they said, we'll be right out there. Right. <laughs> I waited, and I waited, and I waited, and, and then this lady, there's two booths right side by side. And it's not really a booth, but these little things. And so this lady comes up, and she's got two kids with her. And she, you know, she puts her, she takes the receiver, she puts the money in. This gun's just laying right there against my chest. And she's starting to dial, and she, she looked like this. 
and just very calmly, she hangs the phone back up. I, I hear her money click down into the thing, you know, the coin return, and she gets her two kids, and off they go, you know, just down, just like that. And I think she's going to go just a little bit down the road, and she's going to find a policeman, and they're going to come running up. And what am I going to do? And by that time, I saw it, 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 a police car coming this way. And I looked, and I thought, oh, thank you, Jesus. So I, I started to walk out between the two cars, and I noticed something. They weren't looking at this corner. They weren't looking. They are were talking to each other. And so I just kind of held the gun back here behind me and just waited to see, because I'm not running out of a police car in New York City with a gun in my hand. And so, and so they just drive right on by. I waited another 15, 20 minutes before anybody came. And finally I got over against the building and I put the gun in the back of my pants like this and just set against the building like this just so I could... Because I don't know what else to do. I've got this gun. So, so anyway, finally the police come and, you know, they take down all the information and we fill out these papers and, and I, I tell them, make sure my fingerprints aren't on that thing, you know, and wipe it real good. And so then, then I go back to the apartment. Now, I have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful wife. But we were, lived in a tiny two-bedroom apartment. You know, I mean, it was tiny. The kitchen, you, you could barely get two people in it. And so she was in the kitchen when I came in. Now, by this time, I have realized how dangerous the thing that, I'm, that I've just been a part of was. And I'm, I'm walking, and now I'm starting to feel sorry for myself. And I'm starting to think things like this. I could have been shot. I could have been shot. I could have been killed. I could have been shot. And I'm thinking this to myself. And so I get in and, and, I, and I, so I walk into the apartment and very, very, very sober now. Uh, I walked in and I said, honey, come in. Sit down in the living room. You won't believe what just happened to me. And so she did. She came in like an obedient wife and she came right on in and she sat down. And so I go through this whole story and twice... Ten times as much detail as I've just told you. I'm describing this whole thing that's taking place. And I'm telling her what happened to me. And, and so when I finished the story, she looked at me right in the eye and she said, Is that all? <laughs> and I'm thinking, I could have been shot. And she says, Well, you're not hurt, are you? My wife's always up me. Well, you're not hurt, are you? And I said, no, I'm not hurt, but I could have been. And she said, good. And she goes right back into the kitchen doing what she was doing. And I'm thinking to myself, I needed a little more sympathy than that. So David Wilkerson lives uh, just a few uh, uh, story, stories in the same apartment building up above us. And so I called David. I said, David, you're not going to believe what just happened to me. And so I told him the whole story, put in all the details. And then when I got to the end of it, there's this long silence. And he said, Bob, he said, that's about the stupidest thing I've ever heard anybody do in New York City. He said, you took the gun? I said, well, I didn't exactly take it away from him. I just, he said, I don't know. I think you ought to examine your heart. Money means that much to you. And then he says, in 30 years of coming to New York City, I've never had anything like that happen to me. What do you think that says? Is there anything else? I said, no, I think that covers it. And so, so he hangs up the phone, and I hang up the phone, and I'm sitting there thinking to myself, you know, th this is not my day. I, I mean, I'm really feeling this deep inside. I mean, I had this feeling... I mean, I know my wife cares, and I know David cares. I mean, he's, he's you know, a close friend. and I, I, So I knew he, he wasn't being cold. He was just, he's, he's can be very matter-of-fact. He can laugh. And, then, and my wife, I know what she's like. She's, you know, she's, as I, I've mentioned many, many times before, she's as level of this floor. I mean, she didn't get up. She didn't get down. But I expected a little bit of something, like walk over and just rub the back of my hair or something. Say, oh, honey, I'm so glad you're okay. You know, you expect something to happen. Well, what I'm saying to you is that sometimes it appears like God is totally unresponsive to us at a time when we're wanting some sympathy from God. 
We're wanting him to say, we'll go through the trial if God will just come up to us and say, I know what you're going through. Just a little word of prophecy or something. You know, somebody come up and, and use somebody, some vessel to come up and say, are you doing okay? But sometimes we go through trials and it does not happen that way. Are you hearing me? I want you to turn with me in the New Testament. I'm going to show you just a few examples. Mark chapter 7 is a good example of what I just described to you, only worse. Mark 7, verse 24. And I'm reading from the New American Standard, and he says, And from there, Mark 7, verse 24, And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre. And when he had entered a house, he wanted no one to know of it, yet he could not escape notice. It would be interesting to see. What does it say in the book, Richard? He, okay, he's still in the NIV. You know, no wonder he can't keep up. He's got six Bibles over here. You know? <laughs> I'm going to buy him a parallel translation. You know, that's one of those things that he's like a family Bible. You know, you can just barely carry it. You know what I'm talking about? But the, the interesting, what does the book say? In that last verse, it says, and, and he could not escape notice, verse 24. What's the last of it say? Okay. Tried to keep it secret that he was there, but he couldn't. And as usual, news of his arrival spread fast. Now, the King James says it better than any translation that I know. Anybody close to me got a King James? Okay, what does it say? The last part of the verse 24. Oh, I like that. And would have no man know it, but he could not be hid. Did you hear that? Now, let me tell you something. There's this little lady outside the door, and she's knocking on the door like this. Or she's out there yelling or something. But she knows he's on the inside. L look at the next verse. It says, But after hearing of him, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came and fell at his feet. Now, mothers, you imagine this. You have a daughter that you love very, very much. And that daughter has an unclean spirit. And she's being destroyed. And you hear about Jesus, and you hear about his miracles, and you hear about his healings, and you hear about the deliverances, and you hear about, you hear about all the people that are being set free by this ministry. And so you go, you go to him. You found out he just entered the region, and he's inside the house, and you go calling out to him, Jesus! I know you're in there. Well, I love that phrase. I mean, I hope this sinks in tonight. He could not be hid. He could not be hid. Why couldn't he? I mean, I can read in John chapter 8 about a group of people that were getting ready to push him off a cliff thinking they'd do God a favor because they consider him a false prophet and they'd gathered around about him and he's right there in the midst of it. I don't know if he put them all to sleep. I don't know what happened. I don't know what took place. But all I know is that he walked right out from the midst of them. He could hide himself anytime he wants to. He could hide himself. I mean, they walk, he walked right out from the midst of them. He can hide himself from us anytime he wants to. But what this passage is expressing is something inside God that is always there, whether we feel Him or not, whether He's giving us the kind of sympathies that we think we should get from God, or whether or not He's not anywhere around, whatever it is, count on this. He cannot hide Himself from you. Now, if we want a strong faith for difficult times, we better nail this down. He cannot. His nature will not allow him. His character will not. He may appear very difficult to get to, but he cannot be hid. Now look at what happens, though, because this is an amazing story. I know you're familiar with it, but it says, verse 20, 26, Now the woman was a Gentile of the Syrophoenician race, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. Let me tell you something. 
It would have been fine if she had said, Jesus, I've got a demon-possessed daughter. And, I, and I'm asking you, I know what you can do. Lord, deliver her. But you see, it says she kept asking him. She kept asking him. Over and over and over, she kept asking him. It didn't happen the first time. It didn't happen when she first cried out. Something was taking place here. Now, not only that, but this woman, you've got to understand, is a Gentile of the Syrophoenician race. The reason that we're being told that is that she has absolutely no right to the Jewish covenant. I mean, she's a woman that she cannot even come down and say, Hey, look, God, I want you, I want you to answer my prayer because I'm a child of yours. See, sometimes the devil will tell you that you have no right to ask God that. He'll tell you you don't have enough faith. He'll tell you you're not worthy enough. He'll tell you all the things that he can about you. And maybe sometimes you tell yourself that. And you're constantly talking to yourself about how, well, God, I mean, I know he would for somebody else. I know he would for, for so-and-so, but, I, you know, I don't know. I know he did in the past, but I, I'm not sure. And before long, you begin to get this thought that begins to haunt you, and you begin to think about it, and you begin to say, will he? And that's why I say to you, he cannot hide himself from you, friend. I say he cannot hide himself from you. But he will test you. Now, some of you may have heard me say this before, but when I was in India, I remember, I remember coming across, it was in the state of uh, Tamil Nadu, and they have a temple there called the Tiger Temple. And um, we, I was preaching in an area where uh, it was very, very dangerous to be in because of the Hindus. They were, they were very aggressive against any Christian meetings. And, um, and so what they would do is that rather than me staying in that area, uh, the, the people that were putting it on, the, the Indian people, what they would do is they would take me to a hotel that was across the border from, from, uh, from Tamil, and uh, they would put me at that hotel so that they wouldn't have to worry about me being uh, 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 attacked or anything happening to me. And so, so we had to drive this distance. It took about an hour to an hour and a half every morning, not because it was so far away, but because the roads were so bad, to drive this distance. And, and I, was, I, was, um, I was going past, as we go past, there's a temple uh, there's an overpass, and there's a temple over here, and they have these tiger statues and all kinds of statues of gods all around. And every once in a while, you'd hear a bang. It sounded like a firecracker. And so I asked the interpreters and the guys with me, I said, what, what is going on there? And they described this to me. They said, that's the, that's the tiger temple. And um, the tigers protect the deaf god. And the deaf god... Um, is nothing but a statue. And here's what they do. They have to go in and they have to purchase with money, they have to purchase uh, two things. A little piece of paper that they can write their prayer request down on. And then they have to purchase some firepower. That's what that sound was. I don't remember what it is. It's not a firecracker, but that's the sound. You have to purchase that because the, 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 the Hindu priest will light it and he'll sound it off and when that bang goes forth, uh, you have written your prayer request to this God on this piece of paper, and they give you kind of a, a slick substance, and you wrap it up, your prayer request, and you stand back, and you throw your request at that deaf God, and if it sticks, then your prayer is answered. If it does not stick, it's not answered. And since he's a deaf God, they have to fire off that noise so they can wake him up, so he'll be prepared to receive your throw. <laughs> you see, let me tell you something. You know, and it is, it is a funny thing as we look at it, but I, I'll tell you something. The sad part is that sometimes we're practicing something very close to that when we feel like we've got to beg God, we've got to get his attention, we've got to do something to shake him up so that we can, and we're thinking, we're coming to God, and we're saying, God, now please hear me. Please, please. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with asking God more than once. Because Jesus asked his father three times, 
not to have to go through the trial of the cross in the Garden of Gethsemane. I think it's all right to ask God over and over. Don't misunderstand me. That's not what I'm saying. I was taught a long time ago uh, about faith, and I'm not being critical of any, any, I'm just simply saying, I want to get some errors out. It's all right to ask God more than once. It's all right to ask Him over and over and over and over and over. It's all right to do that. That's not a lack of faith if your eyes are on Him as the promise. And you're willing to let Him deal with you any way He wants to deal with you. And you start setting conditions on God and you say, God, I want you to answer it this way. I've got to have this answer. Well, see, you don't know you've got to have this answer because God knows what you don't know. God sees what you cannot see. You may be absolutely certain that this is the way it's got to be, and you're so caught up in the problem, you're so caught up in what's happening around you that you don't stop to consider, and I've done it, you don't stop to consider that God may have a way of doing it that you don't expect at all. It makes no sense to you. But now, here's the frightening thing about this, because sometimes we say, God, throw that thing at him, we throw that prayer request at him and just hope it sticks. Am I making any sense to you? See, and, and we say, well, those Hindus do that, but we do it the same thing. We just don't go through the mechanics they go through. We just throw it up there and say, God, this Syrophoenician woman, she didn't even have a right to throw her prayers at him. She's not a part of the covenant. This was before the cross. Now, look at what happens. This is a shaky thing. Verse 27. And he was saying to her. That means he said it more than once. Let the children be satisfied first. For it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Well, how would you like to receive that kind of reply back from God? Um, are you following me? I mean, this is real, folks. Because sometimes we may not get a word like that. I've never heard God say that to me. But sometimes we feel like that. And about the time you're trying to believe God by faith for something, and somebody else that you know gets an answer to prayer, and they come speaking to you and say, Oh, you won't believe the miracle God worked in my life. You won't believe what he did for me. And you're left standing there thinking like I was with my wife and David Wilkerson. God, don't you really care? Because you're hurting. You see, I mean, they didn't mistreat me. But I was, I was not fearful. I was just dumb during the process, but after I thought about what had happened, fear started rising up on the inside of me. You see? And it was a very real thing. And so, so I know other situations where I've said, God, please do this. How many have ever asked God? Don't raise your hand on this, but how many have ever asked God to deliver you of a particular habit or something that you knew needed to be gone and it didn't happen right away. And then somebody in the same service comes forth with a testimony. God just released me. I mean, he set me free and he did this and he did that. You're watching the baptisms and there's three people in a row that have been delivered from the very thing that you're asking God to deliver you from. And you're sitting there thinking, God, what's going on? And may I tell you what's going on? God knows what you face. He knows exactly what's in front of you. He knows what tomorrow, next week, next month, next year is going to bring. He knows exactly where he needs to build your faith, and he knows where to build it and how to stretch it out. He knows how to take you through the right experience, just the right trial, in order to touch you. He knows. Now, this woman was from the region of Tyre. Let me tell you something. Look, look with me at verse 31. And again he went out from the region of Tyre and came through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee within the region of the Decapolis. Now let me tell you something. I've searched it. There is no record that Jesus ever went back to that region again. This is his first visit, this is his only visit, and he came there to rest. And he's never going to go back to that place. This woman has a demon-possessed daughter. There's nothing that hurts you any more than your children. 
Somebody can insult you. They can hurt you. They can do whatever they want to you. You can handle it. But when it starts hitting to your children, I'm telling you there's pain involved and you're hurting for this. And Jesus is not going to come back to that region. And you know, you know the goddess that's worshipped the strongest in this region, chief goddess, is Astarte, the goddess of beauty. Isn't that ironic? Here's a woman in a, in a land where the chief deity is beauty, and she has a demon-possessed That's not very beautiful. See, I don't know how many times, I don't know how many times she had been, I don't know how many times she had been, maybe to that deity. I don't know, maybe she never did. But there's no, there's no indication. The title of this whole series is Finding Faith in Unlikely Places. And I, I want to encourage you because I want you to understand there are so many cases like this in the Bible Pastor preached, and I, I would like to touch on some things about that next week, about Rahab the harlot. Think about it. Rahab the harlot. You don't expect to find faith in Canaan, and especially from a harlot. And the Bible not only mentions there's a harlot in the Old Testament, when it talks about her in the Hall of Fame of Faith, in Hebrews chapter 11, it repeats Rahab the harlot. Now, why would God do that? God's such a forgiving God. God is not interested in our past. God has washed away our past. Friend, I want to tell you an opinion that I have. I, I, I can't prove it totally, but, but I can prove it enough for me. And uh, how many have ever heard that when Jesus looks at your sins, of course, the Scripture says he forgets them. He, he, it doesn't say he forgets them. It says he remembers them no more. Well, let me tell you what... With that word, it's not the kind of remember. The word for remember there does not mean forget. It means to wipe out. All right? And, and so what, what happens is it's like this. Now you tell me which is the greatest love. If, if you have offended me, and I'm able some way, somehow, through mechanical uh, work or whatever or the touch of God or something, I can completely forget that. I don't even remember it anymore. So that whenever we come into contact and, and we say, and, I, and you say, well, you know, I, I still want you to forgive me for what I did. And I say, I don't even remember it. I don't even know it's there. Okay, that's, that's good. That's good. Now, I, I, I mean, I've used the same illustration and I've said the same thing, so I'm not trying to be critical. But let me tell you what I'm convinced that it really means as I've studied it out. And what it means is that you would come up to me and you say, I'm sorry for what I did. And I know exactly what you did. I haven't. It's not out of my memory. I know exactly what it was there. But it has no effect on me whatsoever. It is not even held in an account. It's been washed away. I can look you right in the eye and know what you did and forgive you for it and not feel anything. Now, to me, that's much more powerful. And that's what God does. But what I'm asking you is this. Why would God go out of his way to talk about Rahab the harlot and remind you and remind me of her past. He doesn't normally do that. But he is doing it. I believe it's because God is trying to raise something up on the inside of us to actually grab hold of this mystery called faith to say, if a harlot who had no knowledge of him who knew just a rumor about him, if a Syrophoenician Gentile who's lived in a land of idolatry could grab hold of it with just that little bit, how much more can I believe you for God? See, I believe God's trying to all through the Bible say, look at where I found faith. A centurion, a centurion, all he says to Jesus is that I have a servant that needs to be healed and Jesus He's talking to him, but this, then it says, apparently, apparently they're walking side by side. They're just walking along side by side. And this centurion's walking along talking to Jesus. Jesus is still walking. And it says, he says, you don't need to come to my place, Jesus. All you need to do is say the word and my servant will be healed. And, and he'll be healed. And not only that, 
but I understand authority because I have men under me and I understand that when I say go, they go and when I say do this, they do that. And the scripture says Jesus marveled. Check it out. The word literally means stop dead in his tracks. I mean, that's something to stop Jesus dead in his tracks. And then he looks and he says, I have not found so great a faith. No, not in all of Israel. We take scriptures like that and we focus on he understood authority. And he did. He did. But what I think God is trying to say is that here's a centurion that had no foundational belief. But somehow in the most unlikely place, a Roman centurion he found faith. I don't know what it does to you, but it challenges me. See, because I've heard all kinds of things about faith. I, you know, and as, as I told you when we started this thing, I, it was such a mystery to me. Paul, I knew, had faith. Jesus had faith. Moses had faith. Noah had faith. But how am I ever going to get that kind of faith? And then he says something like this. If you only had faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, be uprooted and cast to the sea. And all I'm looking at is the mechanics of of a mountain that's got to be removed. And I'm looking at a problem that I'm facing that's a big mountain to me. And I'm saying, get out of here. Move. Do something. Get out of my way. Get out of my life. And it's not moving. And I'm thinking, I don't even have faith the size of a grain of mustard seed. And all God is trying to show us is the potentiality of faith and the possibilities of faith. Have you ever thought of what the Bible says of, about the possibilities. First of all, uh, <clears throat> he says, Paul said, I know in whom I believed, and I am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Friend, I want to tell you something. This word has become so real to me because I'm realizing something. I'm realizing that he gave me a measure of faith. That everybody in here has a measure, and I'm realizing that God's trying to teach me through His Word that He can find faith in unlikely places. When He talks in the Psalms about finding a handful of grain or corn on the tops of a mountain, let me tell you something. When's the last time you went to the top of a mountain? There's a place they call above the snake line, and nothing grows up there. I mean, there could be a few cedar trees or something. But corn does not grow on the top of a mountain, maybe a hill, but not a mountain. And God is saying, I can find faith in the most unlikely of places. I can do something in your life and bring something alive in you. A little woman, John chapter 4. Jesus comes to her sitting at a well. You don't expect to find faith. She's probably... She, she's not a harlot, but she's probably been treated as a harlot because it's the noontime. It's the hottest part of the day, and there she is around. You don't go get water at the hottest part of the day, and nobody else is there. But Jesus just happens to come through, and not only that, but Samaritans are disliked with the Jews because they didn't pick up and go to war with the Jews at a time of crisis in the past. So here's this tradition of, of dislike and prejudice that's there. She doesn't expect a Jew to speak to her, let alone talk to her about living water. And so there she is, and he starts talking of all things about her past and her present. And he says to her, go get your husband. I want to talk to him. I don't have a husband. Well, you said that right. Because you've had five husbands. And the one you're now living with is not your husband. And we read something like that. And please, I'm not talking about excusing sin. But I want you to understand. We read something like that and we think, oh, oh you know, he pinpointed her. He said, and she said, I can perceive that you're a prophet. He wasn't interested in accolades. He wasn't interested in titles. He wanted something because here's this little lady, all right? She's been married five times. You know why she's not married again? She's not married again because it's failed five times. And what she's feeling on the inside is every time I thought this was the one that was going to love me. Every time I thought this is the one that will treat me the way I deserve to be treated. Every time she thought this one will work. And she's so disillusioned 
that she's not even going to marry this guy. She's just going to live with him. Does that make sense? And Jesus comes to her and speaks to her about her sin. You don't expect to find faith there. But you know what happens? He so touches her, so changes her. The next scene that you see in John chapter 4 is Jesus with a group of disciples. And he's talking to them. And he makes this famous statement about the harvest. And he said, the harvest, the fields are white and the harvest, but the laborers are few. And so the disciples look up and say, yeah, yeah, look at the, the tops of the grains. You can see it. It's yet three months away before there's a harvest. And that's when he says, the harvest is here. But you know what he saw? Because just prior to that, it says that here comes this little old lady out of the city. There's a whole string of people following behind her coming to meet this Jesus because she went to them and said, come and meet someone who knew everything about me and told about my whole life history. Think about this. This is the woman that was drawing water from the well in the midst of the noontime and probably up to that point nobody in the whole town wanted anything to do with her. Faith in unlikely places. Why are there so many examples of that? Look, let's look back at this, at this, what I was saying with you, the possibilities of faith. You don't need to turn to these scriptures because they'll be familiar, but in Mark chapter 9, if we wanted to just turn over from there, um, you don't have to, in verse 23, everything is possible for him who believes. Now, I don't know about you, but I've tried a lot of things and it didn't work out. Have you? I'll never forget. This has impacted me probably. Oh, I mean, there have been meetings and stuff, but whenever, whenever, that, whenever that dead baby was brought to this church, I mean, remember that. You know, I, I, I've been traveling the country, and, and I tell you, that hit the news wires. I still, people still say, what about, what about that? What in the world was the church doing with that, with that dead baby? Well, I don't know all the, all of the, the story, but... But I know that, that John Kilpatrick, had, Pastor Kilpatrick, had said you know, not, to, not to bring the baby. But the father brings the baby anyway. And what are you going to do? You're going to look at that, that father who had enough faith to bring that baby. And you're going to say to him, I'm sorry. We don't do that kind of thing around here. Because the press might get all over it. And it just might create some problems for us. And we just don't want to have to deal with that. So... Now, I walked into the church, and I, Steve Hill was in the hallway, and, and I just, I happened to be the only warm body, I think, walking in that direction. And I walked into the church, and Steve said, Bob, Bob, come here, come here a minute. He said, uh, don't go out on the platform right now. I need you to go up in the, in the, in the baptistry, and I want you to pray for this dead baby. And then he's off to the platform, and I'm standing there thinking, dead baby? What's he talking about? And I walked up there, and then here was this baby, this little baby, this little baby. And I'm saying that to you because something happened to me. Because I started trying to generate it. I've never seen somebody resurrected from the dead, and I believe in it. I even believe I'm going to see it someday, Richard. But I'm standing there, and I'm holding that baby in my arms, and the father is alternately looking at my eyes and the baby. My eyes and the baby. My eyes and the baby. And I'm thinking, oh Lord, there are people with faith to raise the dead. I believe in raising the dead. What do I pray? What words do I say? What's the key? What do I speak? What's gonna make, God, I know you can do this. I know you want to do it. I know you do it today, but God, what do I do? And many of us have been in those kind of places. And can I tell you what he told me? Absolutely nothing. Now something did come out of it. The baby was not brought back to life. But I tell you, this old boy was changed. Because I said, God, I don't know what it takes to grow in faith. In fact, part of the reason that I'm speaking on this is born out of that experience. But I determined from that point forward, I was going to study the subject of faith like I had never studied it before. And I was not going to stop studying it 
until it absolutely permeated my being and it challenged me to go where I haven't gone before. Are you hearing me? And so what I did was I don't know, I don't know why God did not resurrect that baby, but I want to tell you something. He did resurrect a pastor. He did resurrect a heart, mine, that I was going to seek him and know him. I'm not under condemnation, but I'll tell you something. I said, God, if I'm ever, ever, ever in that kind of a situation again, I want to so be full of whatever it is that you've got to teach me. And I'll tell you something else. If I'm in that situation again and it doesn't happen, I am not stopping and I'm not quitting. I'm going to prepare for the next one. And if it doesn't happen then, I'm going to prepare for the next one. But I want to see it happen because I know God does it. See, we don't have to live under condemnation because I believe what God is trying to say to us through all of these stories, there's so many of them. I mean, we could go on and on and on about these stories. What God is trying to say to us and get across to us is, listen, my people, I'm the author and the finisher of faith. You're on a pathway with me. You may encounter some things you don't understand, but don't turn it in on yourself to where you start saying, oh God, what do I have to do to believe you? Don't walk away from him. Don't just get disgruntled with God. Don't allow the enemy to put it in your mind. Don't have a controversy with Jesus. But just simply say, God, one thing I know, we sing it here all the time, whatever I see, you are in control. Your faith will be tested. Look, look at what happens. He just said it's not good to throw the children's bread to the dogs. Now let me tell you something. This is a key. Because when he said it's not good to ch throw the children's bread to the dogs, he used one of two words that he could have chosen. One would describe wild dogs. And the other one would describe pet dogs. Or dogs that stayed around the house. Now, they didn't, they didn't treat dogs the way we treat dogs. I mean, they didn't let them in the house, I don't think, back in those times and so on. Nothing wrong with doing that. But I'm saying she recognized there was just one little word. She recognized that Jesus was just leaning toward her. You're talking about faith. I want to tell you, this little lady, she's hanging on anything she can get. And so he says this one little word, dogs, it clicks with her. That's why she says what she says. She says to him, but she answered and said to him in verse 28, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs under the table feed on the children's crumbs. Listen, she picked up one little word. He was not calling her a wild dog. He was simply saying, it's not good to feed the children's bread. Don't, I don't feed the meal that belongs to the children to the wild dogs. And she says to herself, oh, that's it. That one little thing, he's, he's leaning toward me just a little bit. I've got him just leaning this way because he said, little dogs. Oh, but Jesus, not those wild dogs, but those little dogs, you know, they're around the table all the time. And they're crumbs that fall off. They just fall off. And Jesus, I'm convinced of this. I've got a big problem. I've got a demon-possessed daughter. But if I can just get one crumb from your glory and your majesty, it is sufficient for anything I need. Just one crumb. See, when we don't get something answered the way we would like to get it answered, or we're faced with the difficulty of the silence of God, and it's frightening. The silence of God is frightening to me. But I understand he cannot be hid. He says in Mark chapter 4, there's nothing hidden except to be revealed. What I'm saying to you, when you don't understand something and when it's coming against you and all these thoughts are attacking you, understand that Jesus and God, as they wrote this, he is God, but as, it, as the Holy Spirit wrote the Bible, he purposely puts step after step after step after step Old Testament, New Testament, of people who had no right to have faith, who had no faith or such little bitty faith, and God did not turn them away, and he won't hide from you either. Look, look at this. Verse 30, excuse me, verse 29, and he said to her, because of this answer, Go your way. The demon has gone out of your daughter. 
And going back to her home, she found the child lying on the bed, the demon having, demon having departed. Now here, here's what I want you to understand. Why would Jesus put her through such straits? That hurt. I want to tell you something. Moms, you know, that had her dads too. That had to hurt to be wrestling for the life of your daughter and the health of your daughter and, and have Jesus right there in front of you saying, I, I, it's not good to do this. I can't give this to the dogs. She's hanging on. She's fighting tenaciously. She's beginning to understand and realize what Jesus is saying to her. She realizes who he is. He could not be hid from her. Some way, somehow, she's heard about him, and that's all it takes. Can I tell you something? It just takes that much belief. He cannot be hid from you. And in the difficult times you go through, whatever it is, I believe, personally, I believe we're going to have to believe God like that. You know why he was testing her? Because he knew exactly how to build her faith. Because he knew that he was going to leave that region and not return. Now, we've got a different situation. He's with us. But he knew what she was going to go back to. He was going to say that, and she was going to go back to a region. He had to draw that faith out of her. He didn't leave her. He wasn't saying no to her. He had to draw out what she needed. He had to plant something in her and draw it out and so work it inside. He's growing her faith. He's building her faith, and he's drawing it out of her. He knows she's not going to turn around and run. He knows she's not going to get mad when he's not listening. He knows that. He knows that when she's pounding and screaming and crying outside the door, that when he delays, he knows that she's not going to stop. And he knows that you're not going to stop. He'll never put you through more than what he exactly knows is your limit. That's his word to you. And then he says, he says, I'm going to keep pushing. I'm going to keep testing. Not the kind of test you throw a sticky substance against a, a wall and see if it sticks and then I'll bless you. No, he's saying, I know what you need. I know where you're going because when I leave the region of Tyre, I know what my father's told me. I'm not coming back to that region anymore. And that little lady is going to be standing in the midst. Yeah, she's going to have her, her daughter. She's going to have her daughter healed. But how many of you know that you can have a great miracle occur and you can be tested by the world and tested by doubt and tested by circumstances so much that all of a sudden that miracle begins to fade into the background. It happened all the time. People were healed. Lepers were set free. And all they wanted to do was make him a king. Tell me something. There, there's stories and stories in church history as well as the Bible of people who get healed and they don't turn and follow him fully with all of their heart. He wants her to stick. He wants her to make it. And so he says to her, he says to her, I can't respond right now, but keep coming to me. Keep coming to me. Well, I can't answer that right now, but I'm watching you. I see the heart. I see the spark on the inside of you. Keep coming. I'm going to give you another. It's going to be difficult, but keep coming. Keep coming. I can almost see the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit says, look at her, look at her. She's still coming. She's still moving toward him. She's still moving toward him. I see that. She's, I see her heart. I see it bending a little bit. I see a little glimmer of hope. When Jesus puts you through a task for difficult days, he's... He's not just looking at that moment. He's looking out there because he knows where you live and he knows what you have to deal with and he knows what you're going to go through and he knows what it's going to take for you to be able to stand with voices shouting at you to turn away from him. And so he says she's going to go back into the region of Tyre and all these people that worship Astarte, the goddess of beauty, are going to be talking to her every day where she works where she lives, her relatives, her friends, they don't believe in me, and she's going to be there all alone. So I'm going to draw her faith out so strong that I'm going to plant it inside her to not only deliver her daughter, but to deliver her and her daughter from the influences that she will face that she knows nothing about. And that's what God does with us. You may be facing something or having faced something where you're wondering, God, where are you? How many of you see what I'm saying to you? You see, you, you need to ask yourself this question right now, tonight. Because I'm going to close with this. But I do want to pray with you before. Do you have a controversy with God? Be honest. 
Because if you have a controversy with God, here's what happens. You've come to a place where God can't draw you out anymore like he did with this little lady. See, if you've got a controversy with God, you've forgotten the fact that God supplies in strange ways. And you've forgotten that God deals with us in unknowable and unusual patterns. But it's always to draw that faith out. And if you've got a controversy with God because of something that went wrong, it didn't work the way you expected it to, it didn't happen when you expected it or whatever. And I want to tell you something. You can be, I've been in the, I've been in the pastorate, I've had a controversy with God before. I mean, I've been preaching Sunday after Sunday after Sunday before and have a controversy with God. Or if you sit down and talk with me, Richard, and say, do you believe God can do anything? I say yes, and I meant it. Do you believe God will answer your prayer? Yes, I believe he will. But Jesus, why didn't it work? And you develop a controversy with God. Here's what I want to do. I'm going to ask you for a response tonight. And I do want you to close your eyes. For this reason, because you're just in a private little chamber with just you and Jesus. You love him. You want to walk with him? You want to be with him? And you want to obey him? But something has happened in your life. And even though you would not blame God outwardly inside, there's that controversy with God. And I believe tonight that God is coming to you to say to you, I want to remove the controversy and I want to continue to draw you to myself deeper and deeper into me so that I can not only supply you with what you need for the moment, but I can supply you with what you need for that which you have no idea that you need. So what I want you to do is an act of repentance and acknowledgement for God. If, you, if this speaks to your heart, don't you raise your hand if you don't. But if this speaks to your heart and you say, I have, I love you, Jesus, but I have a controversy in my heart. I want you to raise your hand. Just raise it. No one else. Okay, you put your hands down. And you can open your eyes. I'd say probably half the crowd raised their hand. But let me tell you something. Maybe you've been spared of a controversy with God. But you understand that what God is declaring through all of these circumstances, so many of them, where you would not expect to find faith. Why so many stories? Why not, why not just the... the and, and some of them are right there in the Heroes Hall of Fame of Faith. Why so many stories? Why doesn't God just put the stories in about it like Daniel? Daniel is a tough one. I mean, he's, he seems to do everything right. Because God wants you to know, he wants me to know, that he's planted within each one of us a measure of faith. And if we'll let him blow on it, if we'll let him deal with it, you will never find yourself in a position where your faith is too small for what he's called you to do. It may not work the way you want it to work, but he's drawing you out when it doesn't. He's not slamming the door shut. He's opening the door wider, and he's saying, come on, come on, come on to me. I know where you are. I know what you need. I want you to pray this with me. I'm just going to pray over you and for you. Jesus, I'm asking you to heal the controversy that hearts have with you, Jesus. I'm asking you, Lord, that whatever it is, it, it won't matter. It'll be that kind of a healing, Lord, that maybe there's a remembrance of it, but there will be that awesome, awesome knowledge that it no longer can create the pain. But Lord, there'll be a fresh revelation as the eyes of the heart are opened, that they begin to see and feel. We begin to know you're drawing us, Jesus. You cannot be hid. Thank you for this story. Thank you for this, putting this in your word, Lord. Thank you that you're a God whose ears are open. You're not a deaf God. And you see our struggle, and you see what we call faith failures. And to you, Lord, they're just another way of drawing us deeper, 
deeper, deeper. Lord, I, I take authority over any stronghold that may have developed in anyone's mind that's just put a barrier up to you, Jesus. And I'm asking you to destroy it and remove it and take away any controversy in the heart against you. And God, I'm asking you to bring a fresh liberty and a freedom to every heart in this place. Lord, by way of revelation, there'll be a light that come on and says, that's it. I'm still here today because back then you weren't saying no to me. You weren't closing the door. You were opening the door wider. You were saying, come on, come on to me. I know what you need for every hour. Jesus, I'm asking you by the power of the Holy Spirit to bring a fresh liberation and a fresh freedom to every heart that's had a controversy. And Lord, a fresh revelation for every heart that stumbled and fought a lack of faith. Yes, Lord, there is an increase of faith, and there's a no faith, and there's a stubbornness that doesn't receive faith, and there's a sinfulness that will never know faith. But God, there's a people, there's a people who struggled, not knowing that you're drawing them deeper and answering far exceeding, exceeding abundantly what they had thought they asked for. I ask you to bring that peace of mind and that freedom and that joy, a fresh touch of your spirit in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.